The Marathon Bomber sentenced to death. Tonight, what's next for the convicted killer? The strong words survivors had for him. And what they think about the jury's decision. Plus, trouble on the tracks. Did something hit that Amtrak train moments before it jumped the tracks? Aaron Hernandez's fiance has her day in court and talks about what life is like now that her husband-to-be is behind bars. Then we're upgrading the weekend forecast, but could wet weather still be a problem? And the showdown is set on Deflategate. It's Tom Brady versus Roger Goodell. Tonight, who's stepping in to say not so fast? 7 News at 11 starts now. Tonight on 7, Justice Served. The Marathon Bomber, showing no emotion, no remorse. They're not going to blow up our marathon. They're not going to blow up our city. Survivors ready to finally move forward. I have to watch my two sons put a leg on every day. After months of testimony, he'll pay the ultimate price. His justice now. He wanted to go to hell, and he's going to get there early. Johar Sanayev sentenced to death. A live look on Boylston Street tonight, more than two years after those explosions rocked the finish line, the surviving bomber learns his fate. And his fate is death. Jurors taking 14 and a half hours to sentence Johar Sarnayev, and tonight his four victims are remembered. Lindsay Liu, eight-year-old Martin Richard, Crystal Campbell, and MIT police officer Sean Collier. Our coverage of the jury's verdict begins tonight with Dan Housley live outside the federal courthouse. Well, it was a pretty dramatic time inside that courtroom. It went completely silent, and there was a buildup. About 20 minutes as the clerk built up and read the jury's verdict slip leading up to that final decision. All eyes on John Harris and I looking for a reaction as we learned the jury would ask him to pay the ultimate price. Jahar Sarnayev stood and showed no emotion as he heard his sentence, death, for placing and detonating the pressure cooker bomb on Boylston Street that killed eight-year-old Martin Richard and Lindsay Liu. Boston's police commissioner declaring the verdict shows Boston and America won't tolerate terrorism. Whether you agree with the death penalty or don't, I think the message sends that, you know, they're not going to blow up our marathon, they're not going to blow up our city. Most jurors agreed Sarnayev showed no remorse when he put down that backpack outside the Forum restaurant right near the Richard family, walked away and triggered the bomb inside, and then calmly went to buy milk just minutes later. And no remorse when he flashed a finger at a holding cell camera as he waited to be arraigned. Jurors did not agree on a death penalty for the death of Crystal Campbell, killed by the bomb Jahar's brother Tamerlan set, or for the murder of MIT police officer Sean Collier, where even prosecutors said they couldn't be sure which brother pulled the trigger. Still, many survivors and their families declared themselves satisfied and grateful for the verdict. Liz Norton's sons both lost legs in the bombings. I have to watch my two sons put a leg on every day, so, I mean, I don't know, closure, but uh, I can tell you it feels like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. Martin Richard's parents showed no emotion as they heard the sentence or later. Bill and Denise Richard had made a public call asking prosecutors to drop the death penalty, saying the endless appeals would keep Sarnayev in the spotlight and make it harder for the Richard family to move on. U.S. Attorney Cameron Ortiz says the trial and the jury's decision delivered a powerful statement. Even in the wake of horror and tragedy, we are not intimidated by acts of terror. As Sarnayev's defense team left the federal courthouse, Sarnayev was moved back to the federal prison in Devons, where he'll await formal sentencing. He's expected to eventually move on to the federal death row prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. And unless an appeal is successful, eventually to the death chamber. An off-duty firefighter who came to the aid of the Richard family says he's looking forward to that day. His justice now. He wanted to go to hell, and he's going to get there early. A closer look at the jury's verdict gives you an idea of what they were thinking, how they didn't want to deliver the death penalty for those murders which they couldn't be sure that Jahar Sanai was directly responsible for. But at the same time, they were not buying the defense argument that he lacked full responsibility for those other deaths because of family involvement, family influence, or because of his age. We're live outside the federal courthouse. Dan Housley, 7 News 19. As soon as the sentence was read, their reaction pouring in from several people who survived the blast, many of them saying they can finally move on. The night team's Jonathan Hall live in South Boston with reaction. 
Ryan, it's so, so complicated because everybody's different. Some people might say they're ready to move on, but many say the pain is like a marathon with no finish line. And yet, what happened there in the Moakley Federal Courthouse over the water behind me is bringing relief for some. Without even realizing it, you're holding your breath. And once the verdict came in, it was like, okay, now we can, we can start from here. Marathon bombing survivors and rescuers and their families sharing their intense emotions now that Jahar Sarnaya faces execution. But I remember when those bombs went off and I remember the vile, disgusting thing that this person did and his brother and they destroyed countless innocent lives, destroyed bodies and pots. Some of these people credited the defense team with doing their best to save Sarnayev's life, but most found satisfaction with the verdict for the ultimate justice this young man now faces after so callously taking innocent lives two years ago. I'm sure at one time in his life he was a very lovely, caring young man. What he turned into obviously was we know what he turned into. He turned into a monster. Uh, why did that happen? We'll never know. We're going to lead a new normal, many more so than others. Uh, but Boston is very strong right now. And uh, we just want to thank everyone for your support. Marathon bombing hero Carlos Arredondo unfurled a Boston strong flag as his wife expressed her wish that survivors and victims' families will stick together as the years go by. We are truly in, in support of each other, despite differences in our lives and different opinions. And that is something that I do hold as a very positive outcome to today. Different opinions for sure. Martin Richard was the youngest victim. His family wanted Sarnayev to live. They were in the courthouse today for the penalty phase verdict. They chose not to speak. We're live in South Boston tonight. Jonathan Hall, 7 News, 19. The family of MIT officer Sean Collier is speaking out after the jury sentenced Johar Sarnayev to death. Uh, by the way, this a live look at the memorial for Officer Collier gunned down on campus during the manhunt for the Marathon bombers. And Collier's brother, Andrew released a statement saying in part, in my personal opinion, though I am against the death penalty, justice was served today. Thank a cop, buy him or her dinner, tell them to be safe. Let it keep things in perspective for you. I do that today in Sean's honor. Sean, I love and miss you every day. For Dick Donahue, today was already a day to move forward. Here he is in the middle, first day back on the job in two years, and he was promoted to sergeant. Then, just hours later, he learns the man who nearly cost him his life would be sentenced to death. The 19's Brandy Gano is in our control room with more on Sergeant Donahue. Kim, for Sergeant Dick Donahue, this was a day he'll never forget, a day of new beginnings for his career and his life. Transit police officer Dick Donahue is back on the job. A hero from the Watertown shootout with the Boston Bombers was promoted to sergeant. You know, I'm excited for my new position and, uh, and excited to see where it takes me. It was April 19th, 2013. Donahue was among the first officers to track down the Sarnayev brothers in Watertown. He was hit by a bullet in the groin during the shootout, severing an artery. In fact, he lost so much blood, a nurse testified he was essentially dead. It's been a long road to recovery, but with an aggressive physical therapy schedule, doctors and nurses brought him back to life. It takes a long time for things to heal, especially, you know, nerve damage. Not to mention the emotional damage. You know, every once in a while, you'll, you'll I'll see something that'll kind of trigger a memory or, uh, or trigger a feeling. But in the two years, Dick Donahue has defied the odds, healthy and back on the job. Thank and just you, hours hey, after his promotion, word from the courthouse. The jury has reached a verdict in the trial against the Boston Marathon bomber. And then after hearing a sentence of death, made this statement. Just over two years after the events that impacted us as a community and a nation, we can finally close this chapter in our lives. The verdict, undoubtedly a difficult decision for the jury, gives me relief and closure, as well as the ability to keep moving forward. His wife tweeted, a little old lady approached me months ago, said, he placed a bomb behind a little boy and wants justice. Oh, we will give him justice, all right. When Donahue was asked if he ever thought of quitting police work, he said, of course, but right now this is what he has chosen to do, and he'll take every day 
as it comes. In the control room, Brandon Gano, 7 News 19. JP and Paul Norton each lost a leg during the bombings. The brothers were watching the marathon with friends when the bombs went off. Tonight, their mother is speaking out about how she felt as a sentence was read. The night team Susan Tran is live with more on what she had to say. And Ryan, she had so many emotions. Liz Norton has been coming here to court for nearly every court appearance. She says she's felt beaten down and worn out, but when finally that sentence came that it would be death, she says it felt as if a whole weight had been lifted. He destroyed my family. You know, he, uh, you know, he set out to destroy a lot of people that day, and I feel he did. For months, Liz Norton came to federal court searching for justice for her sons. Each lost a leg in the marathon bombings. And when the jury decided Jahar Zarnaif deserved death, Liz says it was a relief. They have the death penalty for a reason, so if his crimes are so heinous, and, you know, how could he not get the death penalty. So if they didn't implement it in this type of a case, what's the sense of having it? For the past two years, she's had to watch her boys, JP and Paul, put on their legs to start their day. They didn't want to come to court, so she came for them. They accepted early on what happened to them, and they felt that no matter what happened, it wasn't going to bring their leg back. Now her sons have started a construction business, Norton and Costello. The proud mom excited they're moving on. She is too, but the man who took her son's legs will continue to take up her time. When I asked if she to attend the execution, she said yes. If I'm around, and I mean if I'm alive. Now Liz Norton says when she finally got in touch with her sons to give them the news, all she said was, it's over. Live outside of the federal courthouse, Susan Trent, 7 News 19. And we're getting reaction from several other survivors. Sydney Corcoran and her mother Celeste both injured when the bombs went off at the finish line. And Sydney Corcoran tweeted, he took away his own right to live. My mother and I think that now he will go away and we will be able to move on. Justice, in his own words, an eye for an eye. And Rebecca Gregory's story has inspired so many people. The Texas woman ran across the marathon finish line this year and wrote a letter to her leg before making the difficult decision to amputate last year. Gregory tweeted, completely numb and waiting anxiously for the day this is really over. My heart and prayers are with my Boylston Street family. Of course, the finish line has become a symbol of strength after the bombings. And once again tonight, it was a spot where many people shared their emotions about Johar Sonayev's death sentence. Night Team's Tim Caputo is right there and joins us in Boston with some of their thoughts. And Kim, just a short time ago, one of Crystal Campbell's friends stopped by the finish line here and sprinkled some yellow rose petals across Boylston Street. This spot has been a place where a lot of people all day today have stopped by to take pictures, leave flowers, and pay respect. A few flowers placed at the marathon finish line not long after word reached Boylston Street that Johar Zarnayev was sentenced to death. Marathon sports manager Shane O'Hara was surprised with the verdict. I really didn't think it was going to go this direction. The first bomb went off right outside O'Hara's store. He ran outside to help and will never forget what he saw. O'Hara was hoping Zarnayev would receive the death penalty. A bit of a surprise, um, but happy. It, that's maybe even a wrong choice of words, but I was um, I was relieved and that it was the verdict that I wanted, so it was something that I, I was uh, glad to be. O'Hara admits this doesn't mean closure, just a step in the right direction. Definitely wasn't any weight off the shoulders. I think I'm, I've been stressed for the last two years. But in the back bay, it's mixed emotions about the jury's decision. Well, he definitely deserves that. I'm not against the death penalty, but I think it's a worse, a worse punishment to be in, um, in that jail. Well, people up with a bomb, you get the death penalty. Others who were on Boylston Street when the bombs went off are still struggling to deal with all they saw and experienced that day. It's been traumatizing. Christian Mady believes if others have to endure that pain the rest of their lives, so should Zarnayev. Regardless of your politics, I think that there's a, a, an idea that we're strong, we're forgiving, we're moving on, and also that punishment should fit crime. And this is really, it sounds terrible, as angry as people are, this is still a cheap out for Zarnayev. While not everyone agrees the punishment was appropriate, everyone is hoping that the appeals process moves quickly. Live from the finish line in Boston, Tim Caputo, 7 News 19. The terror in Boston did not end after the blast at the finish line. Four days later, the city was placed on lockdown as the Sarnaya brothers led police on a massive manhunt in Watertown. Tonight, we talked to several families who remember that fear. The night team's Elizabeth Noreka is live in Watertown with that part of our story. And Ryan, that fear is certainly hard to forget. A lot of homes here still riddled with bullet holes. And while everyone here does not necessarily agree with today's decision, they do agree that they're ready to move on. 
Sergeant Jeff Pugilese was working the night of the Watertown shootout. It's a night he says he'll never forget. There were gunshots going off, uh, explosive devices going off, little lights going off everywhere. Johar Zarnayev and his brother were behind the violence here. Now learning the youngest Zarnayev will be punished for it by death, Sergeant Pugilese says he agrees with the decision. I was very pleased. He caused a lot of harm to a lot of people and families, and they're going to have to live with it for the rest of their lives. You know, and I think him lingering in prison uh, wouldn't be just a serve. The community Sergeant Pugilese protects won't forget that night either. Bullet holes still in homes here serve as painful and chilling reminders. The neighborhood's reaction is mixed about the punishment. He killed our little boy and that, that does it for me. Everyone who was affected, who lost limbs, who lost a family member, who just injured any of it, it's never gonna end for them. But some disagree with the death sentence. Execution in some people's eyes will see him as being a martyr. And a lot of people would rather see him go into the general population and let him do his time just like everybody else. And just like so many others here, Sergeant Pugilese is ready to move on. I'm not going to let this be the defining moment of my life. Sergeant Pugilese goes on to say he's not going to let this haunt him and saying today's decision is justice served. We're live in Watertown tonight. Elizabeth Nureka, 7 News 19. And stay with 7 on the air and online. For more on the Marathon bombing case, download our phone and tablet apps for news alerts. And we're always on WHDH.com. Up next, big trouble for a school bus driver on the Cape. Yeah, he walks the line and winds up in cuffs as kids on his bus make calls for help. A big development tonight in the Amtrak crash investigation. What investigators found on that train that's raising new questions about the possible cause of the derailment? A pregnant woman escapes this huge house fire in Northboro only to run into more danger. Talking about the weekend forecast and the risk for a couple of sprinkles. Which day? That's coming up. And it's getting nasty in the battle over the Brady deflate gate appeal. The war of words next on 7 News at 11. Major development in the tragedy on the tracks. Tonight, we're getting a look inside the investigation. The NTSB says the Amtrak train that derailed in Philadelphia may have been hit by something before it derailed. The NTSB spoke with the train's crew for the first time today, and an assistant conductor reports she overheard the engineer talking with the engineer of a regional commuter train shortly before the crash. And she says that both of them mentioned that their trains had been hit by something. Well, now the FBI will be inspecting the wreckage, looking at a crack in the lower left-hand side of the Amtrak windshield to see if, in fact, it was damaged before the derailment. Eight people died, more than 200 hurt when that train crashed off the tracks. And the NTSB saying that the train was traveling 106 miles an hour, which is more than twice the speed limit there. New at 11, a school bus driver is arrested on the Cape, charged with driving drunk with students on board. A teenager called her mother from the bus, telling her she was concerned about the driver. Police found the bus a short time later in a Burger King parking lot off of Route 6. The driver was given a sobriety test at the scene there. He's now facing OUI and child endangerment charges. All of the students on the bus are okay. And in Worcester, investigators say a tractor trailer hit and killed a 24-year-old woman on Millbury Street when taking a sharp turn there. A man also hit by the truck is in the hospital with leg injuries. No charges have been filed against the driver. A judge officially dropping a perjury charge against Aaron Hernandez's fiance Shania Jenkins. Prosecutors had said she lied to the grand jury investigating the case 29 times. After a short hearing today, a judge decided Jenkins fulfilled the obligations of her immunity deal by testifying in the Odin Lloyd murder trial. Outside of court, Jenkins wouldn't give a solid answer about her current status with Hernandez. I'm feeling great, <laughs> so I'm happy to start my future with my daughter and move forward. Charges are just Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this ruling does mean Jenkins is now able to visit Hernandez in prison, something she could not do while facing that perjury charge. Her lawyer says she plans to do that soon. In Northbridge, a pregnant woman was hit by a car when she tried to escape a home that went up in flames. She was hit when a driver tried to move that car away from the fire. Firefighters there telling us she should be okay, but the fire destroyed the house, which was home to seven people. 
Sky 7 HD over a big fire on 128 South in Linfield. That truck was carrying hundreds of pounds of fertilizer and chemicals. Police had to shut down 128 in both directions while firefighters put out the flames. We can tell you that everything is back open tonight. So we are here to the weekend. We made it. Question is, how's the weather going to be? Uh, it looks okay, Ryan. Yeah, uh, Saturday is a little bit cloudier than Sunday. Sunday isn't half bad and much warmer. 58 in town right now, 59 in Worcester, 55 in Norwood, and the same out through Bedford. The pond is doing its thing. I mean, I could just leave this up here for the next week. Not going to change much at all. Tree pollen running high and severe. Saturday and Sunday may lower a little bit and Monday goes back up again. These are the showers that we need to wash the pollen out of the air. We need a good round of rain to do that. And that's not coming. <laughs> Instead, I have a lot of clouds and very little in the way of wet weather. There might be a couple of showers first thing in the morning. So if you have tea times, just wait it through because it'll just come through really quickly, drop and then move on. It's not like uh, it's going to last for hours, maybe 10, 15 minutes. That's it. And then as we go through the afternoon, just a lot of clouds around blotting out the sun. At times, the sun may break through, too, so it's not totally overcast. We go into the evening and there might be a shower that pops up into the evening hours at any time. We're trying to get a warm front through here. Once it clears on Sunday, we have game to go for sunshine. It may take a little while to come out in the Cape, but We'll do all right in the afternoon, and that's why the temperatures are much warmer. But not to take anything away from Saturday. Low 70s from Middleton all the way out through Hudson, down into Hopedale, Framingham, Worcester. Boston with a sea breeze. Quincy climbing into the low 70s. Marblehead cool. Rockport cool. I should say cooler. Not that chilly. Even out through Cape Cod, at least near Sandwich and Barnstable, we're in the upper 60s. Chatham about 63 degrees. And then the spike on Sunday. Still a sea breeze, so shave uh, about four or five degrees off of that temperature at the beaches. But that was looking like a cool day. Now that's postponed until Monday. Only a 40% chance of seeing a shower tomorrow, by the way, and 20% on Sunday. Negligible, really, in my book. Dry on Monday and then 45% on Tuesday. No long-term drought-busting rains out there. Just not happening in this pattern. Mostly cloudy, 48 to 55, a light southwest wind. So if you're allowed, go ahead and water the lawn and maybe the gardens flower gardens too. Uh, 65 to 74 mainly cloudy with a passing shower. There's the 7 on 7 forecast. Maybe another shower on Tuesday. And then it looks like a slow warming trend. Slow. Next weekend. Early word on that. Looking good. Maybe a warming trend again into next weekend. Have a good one this weekend. All right. You too, Pete. That would be good timing. All right. Still ahead. The Deflategate drama heating up. The Players Association giving Tom Brady some extra support as the Patriots QB's appeal moves forward. Seven Weather is brought to you by Xfinity. Now, on Seven, a showdown set. Tom Brady versus Roger Goodell. The commission says he will make the final decision. Now the union making a goal line stand. Tonight, the deadlock on Deflategate. Yeah, the Players Union says Goodell should not hear the appeal because he's expected to be called as a witness in that appeal. And tonight, the Players Association did release it, the entire letter sent to the league appealing the suspension. Seven's Trey Dare is here now to tell us what's going on. Yeah, Kim, the appeal process in wake of Deflategate is playing out like an old Western. Tom Brady and the Patriots versus Roger Goodell in the NFL. Still a ways off from a showdown at the OK Corral, but based on the early buildup, we're in for a duel that would make John Wayne proud. The latest salvo coming from the NFL Players Association releasing its letter of appeal which calls for Goodell to excuse himself as arbitrator in Brady's case. The document also calling executive president Troy Vincent's impartiality into question and pans the Wells report providing insufficient evidence on which to discipline the Patriots quarterback. The letter reading in part quote no player in the history of the NFL has ever received anything approaching this level of discipline for similar behavior. The change in sanctions squarely forbidden by the CBA and the law of the shop end quote letter also informing Goodell and Vincent that they will be called as witnesses to testify on what the NFLPA calls quote a possible sting operation to try to implicate Brady and the Pats live in the newsroom trade air 7 news 19 all right thank you Trey we'll be right back
to tonight's show starring Jimmy Fallon is next. I'm Ryan Schulteis. I'm Kim Casey. Big day in Boston. And as we say goodnight and wish you a great weekend, we think about the victims, the survivors, their family, and the city of Boston. Good night, everybody.